Aaron on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. Emre, Remok, Zero, and Anya, members of the Emergency Committee for Rojava, Join us on the show this week to talk about the escalation of violence and threats of invasion by Turkey into northeast Syria, updates from the region, and their thoughts on how people in the West can help folks living under the autonomous administration of northeast Syria. You can learn more about their work at defendrojava.org and find related interviews covering some of the subject matter discussed and past events on our website by searching for Rojava. Just a quick warning, there is a very brief mention of childhood sexual assault in Remok's introduction, about three minutes and 50 seconds into the Rojava interview, and then again near the end of the podcast episode, about an hour and 12 minutes into the interview. Before we air our interview on Rojava, we'll be sharing a message recorded a week ago by PAPS Texas of incarcerated activist and survivor of the Lucasville uprising in 1993, Greg Curry about his hunger strike for the ODRC's retaliation to his organizing behind bars at Toledo Correctional. Greg's support is asking folks to contact ODRC officials as he's entered over a month on hunger strike, had his communication meddled with, and has been hospitalized. So they claim that they found a cell phone inside your mouth that you were trying to chew up? It, it wasn't really uh, a, a real cell phone. What, what I did was chewed up and spit out for what they're saying. And they're probably going to say, well, why did you plead guilty? Because the judge, jury, and executioner was Sergeant O'Brien. He ran a sting out. He ran a sting operation on me. He cuffed me. He took me to the body scanner. He, when I spit out that that he felt was a cell phone or what was left of a cell phone, um, he then decided to take me to the hole. You don't have to go to the hole for that. You could go to LPH. He took me to the hole. So he decided everything. And then he came and heard the ticket. They know he cannot run the investigation, witness what happened, and then hear the ticket. Judge, jury, execution can't do it in America unless we all out there let him. So rule 5120-907 and 08 are Ohio administrative codes but they're Ohio laws wrote by Chief Legal Counsel. There's three things that a hearing officer cannot do, nor RRB. This hearing officer did two of the three things that he could not do. RRB duty was to return the conduct report to the hearing officer, but RRB could not hear a conduct report with any of these violations of procedure. RIV proceeded anyway on 512. I appealed to the warden. What they found me guilty. I appealed to the warden, and the warden affirmed on 514. And and the warden's affirmation said he stated Sergeant O'Brien didn't write conduct report, so he's eligible to hear it. There are no procedural errors. The problem is that's a departure from Ohio law and policy. When you read 5120-907 and 08, as I read before, writing the conduct report is merely one of three things a hearing officer cannot do. This Sergeant O'Brien violated the other two things which the warden ignored. The law doesn't say you can pick one to violate or two to violate, or you can pick one to adhere to or two. It clearly states three things the hearing officer cannot do. And cannot isn't a suggestion. It is it is their law. They wrote it. But they also put it into a policy along with the law, and it's, a, it's called applicability of policy, and it states the same thing, that it's three things this, that you cannot do if you want to hear the conduct report. 
So I sent my appeal uh, of the warden's decision by kite since the prison won't let me have stamps out of my property or purchase any. So through the warden's office, his assistant is the one who's supposed to handle that. I sent it on 517. On 522, it was returned to me because the mayor room sent it to the wrong office, according to them, which just delayed it for five days. I returned that kite the same night to the warden's assistant for a second time on 523 to have it forwarded to chief legal counsel at DRC. And again, chief legal is the one who wrote these rules, so this shouldn't be taking this long, it's, it's 40 days now, and I've been on a hunger strike for 28 of them. It, it shouldn't take that long for a decision to be made. Greg, how much weight have you lost? Just by chance I had a chronic care appointment uh, two days before I went to the hole on 5-3, and I'm down to 187 as of today. So I was 220 uh, a couple of days before I went to the hole, and I'm at 187, right? Uh, just like an hour ago, they weighed me. How tall are you? I'm six feet tall. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm, I'm feeling determined as I was when I started, you know, uh, of course, hungry and and all of that, um, and, and, you know, I guess Fridays is always the worst day because at 3 or 4 o'clock I realized that nothing's going to happen uh, this week, and so then I had this long weekend to just sit and wait, and then Monday morning I get up and um Are they force-feeding you? Hopeful. No, it, it's coming, though. They forced me to take an IV uh, last week, and if uh, I'm pretty sure they'll be here in the morning to, uh, or sometime tomorrow and, and, and demand that I either take an IV or they, you know, strap me down and they take they do these IVs again. Um, so... Um, Are you drinking? Water, or are you just? Well, I was I was at first, and then I it, I wasn't getting anywhere with them, so I stopped doing that. Maybe seven or ten days. I'm not for sure about the days. So back here, it's just me back here, so I, I don't know nothing going on. There's no you know TV, radios, nothing. So, but I so I'm just assuming it's like seven or ten days ago I had stopped, and that's what made them. Um, do the IVs, and, you know, they had this mental health team and all of these people uh, come around, and then they talk to you, and then they cut you off, and another person starts talking to you, and then they cut you off and before you can give answers. And then what they do is come to the conclusion, well, see, you're not really coherent in what you're saying. And I'm standing there like, that's because y'all keep cutting me off. Every time I start talking, y'all won't let me complete the sentence. But I'm coherent, and so they try to get it as something mentally is bothering you, uh, in order for them to then take control of your uh, decision making as far as health and, and whatnot. And that's what they were aiming at. Uh, they kept just saying, well, "We see, we can tell you're not really following us." Yeah, I am. Y'all playing games, and I'm serious. That I'm following you very well. There ain't nothing wrong with my mind or my will. And my stomach just hungry, but it ain't like uh, I don't sit around thinking about food all day neither. Um, it, I, in fact, I was uh, thinking just the other day that it's, it's amazing how little you think about food when you're not eating. You know, it, uh, um, you know, at certain times of the day, you might get a little pain in your stomach or something, but otherwise, I, that's nothing. I'm telling you, I'm strong and ready to do this. Ain't nothing wrong with my mind, and I'm seeing this through. So, yes, force feeding is going to come if the, the 
the support from, from the outside don't catch up with where I'm at here on the inside, it, it's, it's going to come. But regardless, until they send me the population and re, and, and, re, and pay me for my property, that all of a sudden went missing in the most secure area of the prison, then they're going to force feed me and force feed me and force feed me. And all of that's going to have to come because I'm not going to stop until I get my resolution. You can find more info in our show notes and can check out a recent interview with member of Prison Abolition Prisoner Support on Greg's case at one hour, two minutes into the episode, mislabeled as September 3rd, 2020, linked on our show notes as well. So I'm speaking with folks from the Emergency Committee for Rojava. Would you all care to introduce yourselves with whatever names, gender pronouns, where you're based, and any other info? Um, uh, and yeah, any other info about yourself? And it'd be cool to hear about how you became a member of ECR and an advocate for the for the Rojava Revolution. I could go first. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for hosting us. Uh, my name is Anya. And um, I'm originally from Ukraine, but I have been living in the United States for the last um, 11 years. And um, I discovered uh, Rojava and the Kurdish movement around 2017. And uh, I found their project of direct democracy, you know, social ecology, women's liberation quite appealing in that they managed to, you know, theoretically, but also in practice to put together all these different struggles on different fronts. So once I discovered it, I started looking for ways to get involved and support the revolution from the United States and uh, have been a member of the Emergency Committee for Rojava almost from its uh, very founding, which was in 2018. And so, you know, the struggle in the United States uh, goes on. (laughs) Thank you so much again. I'll go next. Hello, everyone. I'm Emre Shahin. I'm a a Kurdish scholar from Bakur, northern Kurdistan, who's based in the US. I'm a PhD student of sociology at Binghamton University and I'm uh, working on Rejava revolution, particularly women's autonomous organizing in Rojava. I did some field work there three years ago for two months and I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so I'm zero. I use I use uh, he, they pronouns. I'm based in the US. I'm based in uh, Northwest Pennsylvania, um, kind of on uh, like the southern edge of, of like unceded Erie territory, um, just south of like Lake Erie. I guess wh- what brought me to this revolution was like I, you know, kind of have always been, I guess, more of a libertarian leftist um, without really knowing what that meant or even having a coherent idea of what it involved. I've never had much of a patience for like reading theory or anything like that. And so when I first learned about the Rojava revolution, it was God, it was in 2020. It was like right after the coronavirus pandemic and right before the George Floyd uprisings. And so it was in that kind of like really weird moment where anything kind of felt possible. And this really made a lot of things come into sharp focus for me. Um, it was like a, a, this, this like example of, you know, something that could work at scale. And that was really compelling to me. And so like that, I, I just didn't really have much of a choice after that. I kind of went full hog into studying this revolution and kind of similar revolutions around the world, including like the Zapatistas in Southeast uh, Mexico in the state of Chiapas. And so like that, as, as you're probably aware, Burst, like we're working on a, another show that kind of like, you know, is in conversation with those revolutions and also talking about you know, land back and other other indigenous issues here on Turtle Island in like a North American context. That show is called Where Many Worlds Fit. And, you know, we're, we're getting very close to being able to, to start publishing there. Hi, my name is Rima Knik. I use uh, they, she pronouns. I'm from the Netherlands. I live in a town between Amsterdam and The Hague. And I started supporting the revolution when I started hearing about it in 2015, 2016. Um, I was going through a really rough time personally. I was struggling a lot with my mental health and with taking care of myself, um, like being able to keep a job and uh, keep an income because I was struggling with traumas from my youth. Uh, I was uh, sexually abused or sexually attacked by a close family member as a child. 
And that really got me in an isolated place where nobody could really stand with me and take care of me. So I was left pretty alone. And that's also when I found out about the women's revolution and uh, about the defense against uh, Daesh. And I also got introduced a little bit to the politics of Mr. Abdullah Ocalan. And the revolution gave me so much uh, spirit to persevere through my traumas uh, and to not give up and to understand that what I experienced was not a single event happening to one person, but a lot of people experience things like this and uh, that it's partly because of the patriarchy. Uh, so for me, it was really a medicine to learn about the revolution. And then I started looking for people in the Netherlands for the Kurdish movement. But uh, after the pandemic uh, came and the lockdown came, it was really hard to maintain uh, contact. So that's when ECR came uh, on my path. First, uh, I joined as a member of the study group, uh, which I really enjoyed because um, I feel at home at ECR and I feel comfortable sharing my thoughts and uh, learning from others. And then I was also invited to uh, start organizing with them. And I have done this for a year now. Thank you all so much for sharing. And I, it's really nice to meet you. And as kind of a side note, um, Emre, I was uh, lucky enough to get to hear uh, an interview that you did with Zero for Where Many Worlds Fit. And I'm very excited for the content to start flowing. Oh, great to hear that. I'm excited as well. Um, so in a January chat with a member of Tekoshina and Ashith uh, that we conducted, our guest talked about ongoing rocket and drone attacks across the border into Syria since the Sarakanya invasion of 2019. Could you all, or one of you, please speak about the threat of Turkish invasion looming over the autonomous administration of northeast Syria, a.k.a. Rojava, and what's being expected right now? As an introduction, my comrades and I... Uh collectively decided that I would initially begin responding first and, you know, we'd follow each other. So uh, I'll start with some of the questions and uh, others will uh, hope I won't be taking too much space. But in response to the attack, the Turkish threats of invasions have intensified in 2019, but they have actually, we can date them back to the collapse of the peace negotiations between the PKK and the Turkish state uh, near the end of two, 2015. Between 2009, 2010 and 2015, the Turkish state and the PKK had began negotiations to work on the Kurdish issue. But that came to an end in uh, 2015 when Tayyip Erdogan's our holding party, AKP, lost the elections in June 2015. And to continue its power, it decided to uh, team up with the Nationalist Party in Turkey and ended the uh, peace process. Uh, after this, Turkey's relationship with the autonomous administration in Rojava became extremely hostile. There were voice recordings from secret top-level Turkish state meetings where the chief of intelligence was recorded saying oh, don't worry, we can start a war with Rojava anytime. We'll just have a few of our agents throw some rockets over the border to the Turkish side and use that as an excuse. And from there on, the Turkish state began to increase its hostility. Before that, uh, Turkey had hosted Saleh Muslim, uh, the former co-president of the autonomous administration, twice in Ankara for diplomatic talks. Uh, this was back when the peace negotiations were still on the table. But uh, after that threat of lost power and, you know, regional uh, political realliances, when the peace process ended, the Turkish state initially uh, increased its hostility and then proceeded to invade Afrin. And soon after Afrin, it invaded Serekania in 2019 and it continues its hostile approach to this day. I can add a little bit to that, in particular what's happening right now. So um, Turkish President Erdogan um, 
just announced uh, that uh, Turkey is uh, preparing to launch another invasion, which will be third, the third invasion, as uh, Emre uh, mentioned, the first two, and uh, to basically um, complete the so-called safe zone that Turkey was negotiating to create with the United States in 2019 before it invaded and occupied um, more parts of northern Syria. And now it, Erdogan stated that Turkey wants to uh, complete that project and uh, occupy more territory um, along its uh, southern border with Syria. And at this point, I think we're quite anxious. And, uh, you know, there have been a lot of threats coming from Erdogan because uh, he and his uh, party, AKP, they are using the uh, threats of uh, invasion and actual invasions uh, of uh, different parts of Kurdistan and attacks against the uh, Kurdish population, you know, within Turkey, but also you know, in Syria and Iraq, as a way to rally, kind of, as a way to prop up their authoritarian regime and rally um, support you know, of a broader uh, chunk of uh, Turkish population. But right now there is this um, conjuncture of international and domestic factors that makes it quite uh, possible that Turkey, you know, that Erdogan will actually um, realize his threats and invade once again. So internationally what's happening um, is, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and um, Turkey's role as a NATO member in stalling the uh, process of NATO accession of Sweden and Finland, who just applied to join NATO. And, uh, you know, Turkey stalls their entry through its demands of lifting um, a ban on uh, an embargo on arms sales to Turkey and uh, demanding extradition and crackdown on Kurdish movement in Sweden and Finland and uh, you know, uh, termination of any diplomatic relationship that uh, Sweden in particular has with the autonomous administration of Syria. So, you know, Turkey is demanding, uh, you know, what's in its own uh, geopolitical interest, and uh, it's quite likely that it will get uh, at least partially its demands uh, met. We have already seen some concessions coming from the United States. The Biden administration has recently requested Congress to approve the sale of uh, F-16 jets and uh, modernization kits for warplanes of Turkey, as well as missile upgrades, you know, various military equipment, despite the existing U.S. sanctions against Turkey and despite the opposition to it um, uh, within the Congress. So we, we are seeing that the United States is granting certain concessions to Turkey and, um, you know, green lighting another invasion, as the United States did in 2018, um, you know, could be a likely scenario. I can add a little bit more to that, too. At the risk of making this a little bit, you know, more complicated than maybe you were wanting, <laughs> there, it, because it's a very messy situation. And there's a lot of, like, very muddled history here, even in the last, like, 10 years, because the Syrian civil war is, you know, devastatingly complex. But there's also two other factors to consider, which one one is that there's, like, the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, the AANES, which is, it's it's like the, the, the recognized, in a sense, term for, for Rojava. Um, this is the administration that kind of like runs things. It's like the decentralized thing that's based on democratic confederalism. And we're, we'll get into this later when we talk about the carceral situation as it exists in the region. But one of the things that they have is a set of ISIS prison camps where a lot of like former ISIS fighters have been kept. And there's a there's a number of danger points there, including recently there have been a, like a lot of like mass escapes from these camps, and that's going to also be like a a factor when it comes to stability in the region that I'm sure Erdogan is going to want to exploit somehow. And then over on the Iraqi side of the border, there's also a number of things that have been escalating in violence, which is uh, even involving you know Turkish forces in in some sense which is that the political situation in Iraq, especially in north northwestern Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan, remains a little bit unstable. Or not a little bit, that's that's putting it mildly. But it, it remains pretty unstable, and there's like the local ruling uh, Barzani family, which is a Kurdish family that's much more sort of like hyper-capitalistic, and, and you know, they, they, they just have very different political goals. And there's been a second route of, of, of genocide uh, genocidal action is taken against the Yazidis and the Yazidis are like a local I, I personally am like not knowledgeable enough to get into whether the Yazidis are Kurds I've heard very firm yeses on that question <laughs> but 
whatever you, whatever, you know, however you classify them, the Yazidis are like one of the oldest religious groups in the world. And they're def they're definitely like part of this broader Kurdish diaspora. Um, and so like they've, they've been targeted for genocide by ISIS over the last, you know, five, 10 years. And they're, they're coming under the threat of genocidal actions again by Turkey and, you know, by these coalition forces in the region. And it's really kind of devastating to be thinking about things like this because it's a very dark situation. But there is some light, you know, kind of buried beneath that, which is that the Yazidis are also taking on democratic confederalism and they're, they're realizing their own revolution, which is pretty inspiring. So that was a very complex answer. <laughs> I covered a lot of things that uh, I'd like to um, I'd like to unpack in, in further questions, um, but very very informative, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, and for listeners who who maybe don't recognize the name Yazidi, uh, they may recognize the um, harrowing situation a number of years ago where ISIS had trapped a number of people on Mount Sinjar and were approaching and, and genociding them. And this is uh, one of the instances where SDF forces were able to come in and, and uh, help get those folks to safety. As, as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but those were uh, Yazidi minority being attacked by Daesh specifically. So Turkey is the second largest military in NATO, uh, thus a United States ally. And as was pointed to by Anya, there's uh, ongoing like arms sales that are that are being proposed and, and engaged right now between the U.S. and and Turkey. I wonder if you all could talk about what you understand to be the motivations of the Turkish state under Erdogan's AKP and now aligned with the Nationalist Party. Um, what is neo Ottomanism, and can you say some words on transformations of life in Turkey over the last twenty years of AKP rule and how this relates to the war on Kurdish people? within and outside of Turkish borders. Yeah, if you can make mention also of, um, during this time, support for groups like the so-called Free Syrian Army, and uh, as well as ISIS or Daesh. Absolutely. In Turkey, uh, since the foundation of the Turkish Republic, has had a different sort of political dynamic and diplomatic presence in the globe uh, throughout the 20th century with the, you know, Republican Party uh, most uh, in power most of the 20th century uh, with the collapse of, of the Ottoman Empire. It didn't have this neo-Ottoman uh, strategy and uh, the Turkish state for the most part, spent the 20th century trying to modernize the population, the mo you know, modernize the country, so-called separation of church and state, and turning its face towards the West, you know, aspiring to be a, like modeling itself after European countries. And <clears throat> this was quite unique in Muslim majority countries, because in Turkey too, majority of the population being conservative, Turkey, has, had had that sort of identity crisis with Western facing, but uh, Eastern being <laughs> population and geography. However, Erdogan's AKP, uh, when it came to power in 2002, adopted a different approach. It's a populist Islamist party, neoliberal uh, Islamist party, which uh, said, I'm not going to just face towards the West, I'm going to face towards the East too. I'm going to reconnect with the East, with the Middle East, you know. Uh, but this is only a part of New Ottoman policy. Another part is trying to resurrect the uh, Ottoman Empire's sort of legacy. You know, Turkey has had this trauma of shrinkage, you know, after centuries of ruling over the Eastern Europe, Middle East, Northern Africa, after shrinkage to the Turkish Republic. Now, with Erdogan's AKP in power and cementing itself further and further into the Turkish state, it tried to increase its influence in the Middle East. And uh, many of Turkey's diplomatic maneuvers over the past 20 years can be read from this lens, you know, from Turkey's presence in Rojava and Syria to actions in Libya and Qatar. Uh, there's this 
diplomatic shift. But of course, Erdogan's coming to power had political implications and impacts inside the country too. Life has become more and more conservative. Public life has been shaped more and more. The Turkish state has been investing in religious schools, the re- minister, uh, the directorate of religious affairs, which, by the way, even though it's not a ministry, its annual income is higher than the sum of like seven, eight different ministries in Turkey. That's why I said the so-called separation of church and state, even though Turkey is a secular country, the state has tight control over religious affairs. So life has become more and more conservative in Turkey. And these developments the uh, at home and abroad Islamification went hand in hand, of course, as we saw from Turkish involvement in Syria, Turkey has been causing up to lots of Islamist groups. Like you mentioned, the Free Syrian Ar- Army had many factions which are basically uh, run from offices in Istanbul or Hatay in different Turkish cities, representatives, you know, Free Syrian Army or Free Syrian, uh, you know, their political wings representatives residing in Turkey. Uh, However, this is only the acknowledged openly available information. Turkey also had deep connections with extremist Islamist organizations uh, in the past 10, 20 years from Al-Qaeda in Syria and Iraq to ISIS, which later transformed into Turkey has had uh, close ties. There have been many cases where Turkish journalists have uh, uncovered hundreds of hundreds of trucks of ammunition and guns sent to Al-Qaeda affiliates in Syria by the Turkish state from Turkey sent into Syria. And Turkey still has significant presence in Idlib, which is part of northwestern Syria, which is not under the control of FSA, Free Syrian uh, Army, actually. It's under the control of Al-Qaeda in Syria, and Turkey, you know, works closely with Al-Qaeda in Syria. Also, ISIS, there are many reports from the past five, ten years where ISIS leaders freely reside in Turkey, recruit in Turkey. When they're caught, they're only caught for show, and immediately released. There were reports that even Putin back in 2015 hinted at when they were not so close with Erdogan of oil trade with between ISIS and Turkey. And Turkey has maintained close relations with all these Islamist groups from the most, you know, lightweight versions such as Free Syrian Army to the most extremist versions such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And you know, Turkey is trying to instrumentalize these Islamic groups in its project to expand, you know, restore you know, Ottoman glory, you know, establish more and more direct influence over the Middle East and North Africa. Turkey used mercenaries that it recruited from these Islamist factions and sent them to Libya in its presence and fight in Libya. The same goes for Nag- Nagorno-Karabakh. As you remember, a year ago, there was two-month war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and Turkey was actively participating in the war on the side of Azerbaijan, and hundreds of Islamist recruits were transported from Syria to Azerbaijan via and by Turkey. So Erdogan has been Islamitizing both life at home and, you know, Turkish diplomatic approach to the Middle East and instrumentalizing these Islamist factions on groups. I actually don't think there is much to add to Emre's comprehensive response. I would just want to reiterate that Syria, as Emre mentioned, is a like blatant example of uh, Erdogan's pursuit of a neo-Ottoman imperial you know, uh, agenda. Because what they're doing in northeastern Syria, you know, Turkey, is not just you know trying to prevent. Uh, you know, any existence of an autonomous Kurdish polity, but basically preparing a basis for annexation of that te- of those territories that are currently occupied by Turkey and its proxies, right? Described by Emre, uh, you know, they're usually referred to as um, Syrian National Army because there is a process of ethnic cleansing and demographic engineering going on. There is a process of establishing direct Turkey's administrative 
and political control of those territories. Uh, and I'm referring to the territories uh, that were occupied you know, in three steps in 2016, 2018, and 2019, with the last two occupations, uh, those were uh, of the territory that used to be under control of the autonomous administration. So, so you know, they basically create a reality that this part of Syria will become Turkified and Turkey will have, you know, an excuse, a pretext to, uh, you know, uh, perhaps not officially, but basically annex, in practice, annex uh, that territory. I was wondering, as a follow-up, Anya had mentioned the uh, like tur- Turkification, if that's a word, of the so-called buffer zone area, and the area that is Rojava and is that part of the world is Kurdistan is not just made up of Kurds. It's made up of lots of different languages, ethnicities, religions that have lived there for centuries and centuries and centuries alongside of each other under various regimes. But it's a very complex and diverse area. And my understanding is that the Turkish state is moving out Kurds from that so-called buffer zone between Bakur and um, and that part of Syria and Rojava, um, so as to create discontinuity between different Kurdish majority populated areas that fall under that within the borders of these different nation states. I'm wondering if that's sort of what you're pointing to, and also if anyone has any knowledge of what, how the Syrian state is dealing with the destabilization of its borders by Turkey. Turkey has been forcing Kurds to move out through torture, through, you know, pressure uh, from these parts of Rojava that have been under its occupation over the past 10 years. And this is actually an old policy that Turkish Republic had used in the 1920s and 30s after the transition from Ottoman Empire to Turkish Republic in parts of Bakur that are at the sort of borderlands between Kurdish majority and Turkish majority regions. The Turkish state would force Kurdish populations and bring in Turks from Anatolia, Western Turkey. And Bashir al-Assad, current Syrian president's father, in the 60s took from the Turkish playbook and created this Arab Belt policy over a decade, Hafez al-Assad, Bashir al-Assad, al-Assad's father, would force Kurdish communities in uh, today's Serekanye, Grespi, and Azaz, parts of Rojava. Uh, Kurds were forced to move out, their citizenships stripped, unable to, you know, have their lands, unable to hold any property, unable to even have official documentation, and forced to move to big Syrian urban centers such as Damascus and Aleppo. Hence, we have Kurdish ghettos in Damascus and Aleppo. And Assad moved Arab families from Arab majority parts of Syria under this Arab Belt project, which was inspired by Turkish Republic policies of the 20s and 30s. So Erdogan is playing from that playbook and continuing this demographic engineering. And there's numerous uh, evidences from Afrin all the way to Serekania of this happening, unfortunately, which is a direct contrast with the pluralist and harmonious direct democratic model that's implemented by the autonomous administration in Russia. Uh, I think you also asked uh, about the Syrian government's you know, uh, attitude vis-a-vis Turkey's occupation and the process of demographic engineering. And um, I mean, I would say that the Syrian government is not you know, an independent autonomous actor. It, it has survived all these years of uh, civil war just because of Russia's support. So, uh, you know, whatever its interests are, it has to balance them off and ultimately follow Russia's lead, what, whatever is in Russia's um, geopolitical interests, whatever Russia you kind know, of sees as uh, profitable for itself uh, in terms of uh, you know, Syrian future. So while um, in its discourse, right, the Syrian government uh, opposed uh, Turkey's invasions and ongoing occupation and you know, its uh, ongoing presence on the Syrian territory, you know, what happened in 2019 was that after Turkey invaded 
you know, there was a deal made first, uh, actually two deals, uh, first uh, a ceasefire between Turkey and the United States, and then a deal between Russia and Turkey. And according to that deal, uh, Turkey was allowed by Russia to basically keep control of whatever territory it had occupied but by that time. And that's the territory that's currently occupied between um, Serekania and Tel Abyad. So, you know, basically at that moment for Russia, it was, you know, convenient to make the deal with Turkey and let it, um, you know, keep its presence and uh, continue establishing all the political, administrative, economic structures and bringing in families of the Syrian National Army fighters to change the demographic, uh, all the all the processes. And uh, at the moment, it looks like that Russia may green light another uh, invasion by Turkey, again, because of the situation in Ukraine. So Turkey all this time has managed to sort of play off, you know, both the West, you know, the United States, NATO bloc, and the Russian bloc, right? Like Emre um, mentioned, that's sort of in between the West and the East in its policies. And the uh, same when Russia's invasion of Ukraine happened, Turkey didn't really support any of these two blocks. So it sort of managed to carve out a position in between, sort of not breaking off completely from Russia, but at the same time is, I think people know, supporting Ukraine militarily, you know, by providing um, drones, right? They have been key in Ukraine's ability to defend itself. And, you know, at this point, some of the latest statements made by Russia's high officials sort of indicate another potential deal um, in which Russia could green light another invasion in return of, kind of Turkey's uh, certain concessions vis-a-vis -vis the situation in Ukraine. Thank you for that reminder, Anya. And I'd like to quickly add to the question about the Syrian state's responses to Turkish threats and practices of invasion, both uh, during the invasion of Afrin by Turkey and during the invasion of Serekanya, all the official statements coming from the Syrian government were along the lines of, you know, this is a breach of our national sovereignty and we will fight for each square meter of our land, etc. But in Afrin, there was no Syrian army resistance to the Turkish invasion because in practice, you know, torn with the civil war, Syrian state did not have any sort of capacity to uh, wage some sort of resistance to Turkish invasions. With the invasion of Serekania, things began to change because the autonomous administration, still unrecognized and, you know, fighting for its survival, unable to resist Turkish invasion by itself and unable to garner American support, enough American support, because Trump basically sold out Rojava in 2019, uh, over the phone, quick conversation with Erdogan, and he uh, ordered his troops to leave and allowed the Turkish state uh, to send in its army. Uh, so Rojava caught him between this situation, unable to garner enough U.S. support, agreed to open up the border areas of Rojava, the northern area with you know along the border with Turkey. The majority of those border areas, for all the way from. Mambij Serekania in the west to Derik in the most eastern part of Rojava. Syrian army troops came back in, in smaller presence, uh, uh, but still there wasn't any resistance or any fight against Turkish invasion. Assad's strategy is basically this. Assad views Rojava, the autonomous administration, as traitors who are, you know, working with the main enemy, the U.S., you know, using U.S. supports to carve out some sort of autonomy and unable to finish off Rojava, you know, attack and finish off Rojava by itself, unable to do that. Uh, Assad has been using this strategy of showing that so that Kurds or, you know, peoples of Rojava accept some sort of slightly worse result. So Assad is basically saying, I will only come and work with you against Turkish threat if you give up on this project of autonomy and come back into the control of the Syrian state. So uh, Assad's strategy has been pretty much this, and this hasn't been really working because you know the autonomous administration and the peoples of Rojava do not want to give up uh, their autonomy and the model of 
direct democracy and democratic confederalism that they've been establishing there. If you like the work that we do at The Final Straw and appreciate the voices we bring you, consider helping us out by sharing our episodes, subscribing to us, rating us in podcast apps, amplifying us on social media or in real life, and giving us feedback or show suggestions. You can also purchase merchandise via Big Cartel, make one-time donations on PayPal or recurring donations on Venmo or LibrePay, or subscribe to us on Patreon to get some fancy thank you gifts. That money goes to host our shows online and pay our transcribers, who've been working for a year and a half to transcribe each episode for easier sharing, web searching, printing, and translating. Oh, you can translate us too. Finally, we are always looking to get more broadcasts on Radio Waves. Check out our radio tab on the website for how you can help us get broadcasted on your local radio station. And thanks for your support. The Final Straw Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Are you tired of listening to Western experts talking how the world works? Is another portion of liberal analysis of the uprising makes you fall asleep? Well, then check Elephant in the Room, an anarchist radio show from European Dresden, where we interview activists who are participating in struggles around the world. Elephant in the Room is a proud member of Channel Zero Network. You can find our show on your favorite podcast platforms, CZN website, or somewhere on the internet. From activists? For activists. So we've mentioned both conflicts in northern Syria in terms of actors like the United States, Turkey, Russia, the Syrian government, and the Autonomous Administration, and also the conflict in Ukraine has been mentioned, and the U.S. shares membership in NATO, the North American Treaty Organization, with Turkey, so they're therefore armed allies to each other, which, I mean, for anyone listening right now, you're going, <laughs> unless you've already heard some of this before, your head's probably going to be spinning about all the different proxy situations that are going on right here. But so in terms of the amplification of the war between Russia and Ukraine since March of this year, um, the, the war that's been going on since 2014, there's been a lot of coverage and we've we've talked to, to folks both from Russia and, and folks in Ukraine about the experience of the war there. And the U.S. has been providing weapons to the Ukrainian government to fend off the invasion from Russia. So a, a, as an anarchist, personally, I have to say I condemn the existence of NATO, as I do with all states. Um, but I also support the right of communities to, to defend themselves from violence, including from invasions, particularly when they're attempting to grow a feminist, anti-capitalist, anti-authoritarian and ecological revolution, as one sees in Rojava. I wonder if you all could talk about these two situations and the correlation between them, you know, the the use of, of UK, by Ukraine of Turkish drones, for instance, in this circumstance is, you know, just m kind of mind boggling. But, you know, you do what you can to fend off invasion. Um, but do you feel like the invasion of Ukraine by Russia has kind of overshadowed conflict points in other parts of the world? And how do we do a better job of spreading out and expanding our solidarity into places like Tigray in Ethiopia or other conflict zones um, that are ongoing? I'll start off since uh, I'm actually from Ukraine, as I mentioned. Uh, so this is a topic uh, close to my heart, even though I haven't been living there for the last 11 years. I still have family in the east, in the Donbass region. So, you know, I've been quite kind of emotional and personally affected by the situation. But more generally, I just want to point out, and I think it's, it has been quite obvious that uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has once more revealed the hypocrisy and double standards um, on part of the United States and other international actors, you know, the so-called West, because we've, we have seen a huge outpouring of support, of military support, of discursive support, uh, you know, in incredible coverage in the mainstream media for the resistance of Ukrainians, right? I mean, we've seen pictures of kind of grandmas with Molotov cocktails and all this cheering for that resistance. However, many people have pointed out that, you know, that unconditional support is not usually granted to 
other instances of armed resistance going on in other parts uh, of the world. I mean, you name it, you can, you can Palestine or Tigray that you just mentioned, or even the PKK, right, which is sort of an armed insurgency against uh, you know oppression uh, by the Turkish state. Kind of justified, right? But the PKK has been uh, on the U.S. terrorist list for the more than two decades now, as well as on the terrorist list uh, of other countries. And uh, you know, even though the United States have been supporting uh, the autonomous administration of Northeast Syria, it has not, you know, as far as we can see, it's not planning to take off the PKK off that list, right? While at the same time supporting uh, unconditionally. Um, the resistance of Ukrainians. So, you know, this situation is just uh, another example that, you know, when it comes to resistance, uh, it's only supported when someone's uh, geopolitical interests are on the line, right? So that, that's what matters and not resistance itself. And, uh, you know, another parallel uh, that we can draw is uh, between, you know, the invasion of Ukraine as a sovereign state uh, and then Turkey's several invasions of Syria, which is a sovereign state and Turkey's um, committing egregious war crimes and human rights violations, which are right now covered in the mainstream media, th those that are committed by Russia in Ukraine. I don't think we have seen uh, that much coverage uh, when Turkey invaded Syria, North, uh, Northeast Syria repeatedly, right? And uh, again, in terms of kind of material, you know, material response to the invasion by Turkey, in particular, the last one in 2019, as I already mentioned, Turkey was basically allowed to occupy the territory that it invaded. And uh, yes, there was kind of a discursive opposition by you know, some parts of the United States government. There were some sanctions implemented in response to that invasion in 2019. But that, those sanctions were removed almost immediately once the ceasefire was signed and Turkey basically remained in the occupied territories. Again, I mean, I think we, we see a drastic difference kind of which whose invasions are permitted to to take place and whose are um, opposed and uh, just one last thing i think it you know the invasion has definitely overshadowed uh, other conflicts at least in the mainstream media and uh, i think turkey has been taken advantage of that um, i think later on uh, we we're gonna discuss more in detail the um, military operation that Turkey launched into northern Iraq, uh, which is, uh, you know, the Kurdish region of Iraq uh, earlier this year in April, which uh, recently mentioned. And uh, right now, Turkey is trying to capitalize, you know, on the invasion and uh, launch uh, uh, its own invasion, another invasion into northeast Syria. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the Turkish government sort of take it, is taken into consideration the fact that right now kind of the media coverage and sort of the government uh, actions are focused on the situation in Ukraine and it may get away with another invasion with less coverage. Anya, that answer was beautiful and I really, really appreciate it. I think that there's uh, there's some things that I feel like I can add to that answer, which is I think that like a lot of what I'm going to have to say like like this entire conversation has been is going to be really complicated and like people's eyes are probably already glazing over and so I do apologize for that and so I feel a responsibility to start with this which is that if you're somebody in the U.S. and you're feeling kind of powerless the really important thing to remember is that our fates are tied there is no freedom for us without freedom for them there's like a number of different ways to express this idea and there's a number of different ways that it manifests like we in the imperial core and like people on the periphery or you know like in the global south or whatever euphemism you want to use to describe it i definitely do mean that we're in the same struggle together but i also mean something a little bit more specific than that so a lot of hay has been made in the media um and in in like a lot of like so-called western sources about the wheat harvest in ukraine um because it is definitely true that like ukraine is the world's you know breadbasket, basically, even more so than the American Midwest, which is where I live. And like we have, you know, wheat crops everywhere. And like these global supply chain issues that we've already been dealing with during the coronavirus uh, pandemic, again, are extremely complicated. And like there's a lot of that's going on everywhere. <laughs> but a really, I think, underreported aspect of this is that 
Turkey as like a polity, as like a political entity, like the Erdogan regime in particular, has been f***ing with the water supply going down into Rojava. And so before this year even, Rojava was already well under what it needed to be for its wheat supply. A lot of its like supplemental wheat supply does come from Ukraine and there's like a lot of, you know, different issues that go along with that too. You mentioned Ethiopia and the Tigray people. They also are pretty affected by like the war in Ukraine and like the, the kind of like serious shortage in the in the wheat harvest. But in Rojava, the way that this, you know, is is kind of looking on the ground right now is that they don't have as much water as they need. They definitely cannot produce all of the crops that they need to, to produce in order to feed all of the mouths that are there. But things are so bad in the region, I think that like talking about the coronavirus pandemic and the way that that looks on the ground in Rojava kind of is it like an afterthought almost? <laughs> as f***ed up as that is. But like one of the things that happens there is because the, the AANES, the, the autonomous administration, because they don't have international recognition, that means that the like doses of the, of the vaccine that are meant to go to the people who live there don't. They go to the Assad regime, right? And so like, if you're looking for something that you can do and you're in the US and like, or you live somewhere in the Imperial Corps, one of the things that you can do as frustrating as it is, is like lobby your representatives. It's f***ing frustrating as that is, believe me, I understand. <laughs> but like, that is that is something concrete that you can do, is is, co is contact your representatives and try to lobby for like recognition of, of the autonomous administration as like a separate polity. I think that like, it might be a long shot, but it's definitely something that would help the people there more than any other direct action that you can take like from the Imperial Corps. If you want to take like a personal step, maybe this is oversharing and maybe you can cut it, but there, there's ways to make friends like online with people who are in pretty desperate situations. And there's ways that you can, I don't want to say leverage, but there's ways that you can take those personal friendships and make those into a kind of mutual aid. So like an example of what this might look like is like right now on OnlyFans, <laughs> there's a ton of sex workers who are based out of Ukraine or from Ukraine or are fleeing, you know, persecution or, you know, fleeing violent conflict. And the only way that they have to really make money very quickly is to turn to sex work. And so this is an example of like an area where there's a ton of things that overlap with a lot of the struggles that people are familiar with in the U.S. And it's even on a platform that's pretty, you know, pretty, pretty common and popular in the U.S. And so if you're looking for direct like ways to directly support people and you're not like, you know, there's definitely like mutual aid funds and all kinds of other stuff that you can get involved with. But if you're looking to make friends and kind of have a personal bond of solidarity with somebody, you could do a lot worse than something like that. I think I'm talking a little bit too much, but that's that's basically what I wanted to add. So in an interview last year that Duran Kalkan of the uh, Kurdistan Democratic Communities Union, which was conducted by the group Peace in Kurdistan, Mr. Kalkan spoke about his view that while Western governments like the U.S. may strategically partner with the Syrian Democratic Forces under Rojavan control in the fight against Daesh or ISIS, they are not committed to the project of democratic confederalism, but only destabilizing Turkey and opposing Russia and Iranian influence in the region. So as someone who's based in the U.S., such as myself, um, I find this to be like a really poignant point of interaction with what's going on in in. A, the AANES and and within Kurdistan more widely and with the Rojava project. Could you all speak a little bit about the U.S. relationship with Rojava, the illegalization of the Kurdish Workers' Party or the PKK, as well as the KCK, which I just mentioned, the Kurdistan Democratic um, Communities Union, um, and and what impact that has on the ground in areas controlled by the Autonomous Administration? <laughs> The U.S. has uh, had quite a contradictory approach towards the PKK and uh, Rojava revolution. Since 1998, the PKK has been on the terror list of the U.S. And the U.S. has actively been supporting Turkey in its war on the PKK. However, when the time came around 2014, around... Uh, the time of Kobani resistance, where ISIS had encircled the city, the U.S.'s relationship with the Kurds began to change slightly, and this was mainly due to the fact that the U.S.'s plans to fund the Islamist factions and Free Syrian Army, you know, actively supported by Turkey and Saudi Arabia, had backfired. The Free Syrian Army was covering, you know, losing ground to ISIS. The U.S. didn't see it as an effective partner. 
but it wanted to uh, continue its presence in Syria, you know, due to several reasons, Syria's ge geopolitical uh, position, the proximity to Israel, the U.S.'s closest ally in the Middle East. Uh, the U.S. wanted to stay on the ground, but it was finding itself less and less able to do so only through the use of Free Syrian Army. It needed another partner on the ground, and the only option that was available was the autonomous administration. And with lots of international outrage, with solidarity from comrades all over the world, public opinion was shifting, you know, I, people were becoming more and more uh, aware about ISIS atrocities, uh, and, you know, combination of this urgency and the ineffectiveness of the FSA uh, resulted in Obama sending military equipments initially to the autonomous administration and then the U.S. establishing ties with the autonomous administration. I would uh, agree with the analysis and the statement of Duran Kalkan. We have many examples from recent past that support his hypothesis that the U.S. is not committed to the project of democratic confederalism and is only approaching uh, ANS, uh, the autonomous administration, as somewhat of a proxy without really supporting it, without acknowledging it fully, without, you know, with limiting its support only to military so that it keeps holding that area and ISIS doesn't come back. We know that democratic confederalism is a sort of antithesis of American hegemonic policies and uh, practices. It's completely reverse of the U.S. state's approach to, you know, from neoliberalism to questions about women's rights and, you know, gender uh, equality to ethno-pluralist understandings of life and politics to decentralized community control over everyday life and decision-making in different areas. These are, of course, in a way, threatening uh, for the U.S. The U.S. has always been hostile to left-wing movements. But this has been highlighted during the Cold War era, and even up to this day, its political approach to left-wing, any left-wing resistance across the world is destabilizing and destructive. This has had a tremendous and terrible impact for the peoples of Rojava because of this lack of recognition, this lack of understanding of Rojava's political, economical, social organization and only focusing on the military and geopolitics of what's going on in the region. The support has been shaky and as we saw in 2019, I mean, this, uh, the invasion of Afrin was made possible with the green light given by Russia because Russia and the U.S. have this unspoken deal where they have shared areas of influence in Syria in areas that fall to the west of the Euphrates River. Russia has military control, Russian warplanes roam the skies, in the areas to the east of the Euphrates in Syria, most of which, you know, all of which, under the control of Rojava and the autonomous administration, the skies are controlled by the U.S. And because of that dynamic, Occupation of Afrin was made, was made possible with the green light of Russia. However, the occupation of Serekani in 2019 was made possible with the green light of Trump and the U.S. government. And with that invasion alone, 400,000 people were displaced in the region. And that's close to 10% of the entire Rojava population. Serekani and Grespi were instrumental in the storage and processing of agricultural products. So there's been a major hit in that sense too. People's education was disrupted. Schools were closed. So this sort of contradictory, shaky uh, approach of the U.S. towards the political project in Rojava manifests in hundreds of lives killed, hundreds of thousands of people being displaced three, four towns being semi-destroyed and people's access to water and food being extremely limited, uh, limited and it's been devastating 
the region, which is why we need not just military support from all around the world, but also political support and a deeper understanding about the uh, political project that's going on in the ground. As was mentioned already, I think Zira mentioned it, in January there was massive breakout attempts by members of ISIS, or Daesh, fighters and families um, from the prison and refugee camps at Hasheke and al Hol, where the SDF had been holding them and international condemnation was broadcast about the conditions there all over the media. I think there was a lot that was lacking from the discussion about the fact that a huge number of those Daesh prisoners captured after the destruction of the attempted creation of a theocratic state or caliphate by ISIS are foreigners whose home countries won't relocate them. Can you all talk a bit about what happened to Syrians that were held as Daesh and sort of break open this topic a little bit more about the difficulties of not being recognized as an official state formation and yet being in some ways held to the same humanitarian requirements as state structures that don't have an interface with you like how has international scrutiny caused differences in treatment between people internally displaced by the conflicts in syria sometimes you can shorten idp internally displaced people versus those internationals who travel to syria to join daesh this has been a sore spot in in July of 2019, while I was doing my field work, I attended a three-day conference, uh, which was held by the autonomous administration, on this particular issue on the on how to deal with ISIS prisoners. Guests from all over the world were present there, uh, along with a couple uh, people from the U.S. too. And there is this discrepancy. So currently, there is a little over. 2,000 former ISIS members uh, imprisoned in the uh, Hasekia and Ahol camps that you mentioned, and a little over 10,000 relatives, you know, family and children of these people uh, held in these camps. A little over a third of these prisoners are foreigners. Interestingly, Central Asian countries have had a much, much more constructive approach and have been repatriating their citizens who went and joined ISIS and were captured by Rojavan forces. For example, Uzbekistan has has taken back more than 300 former ISIS members that are Uzbek nationals. However, many of the Western countries uh, refrain from doing so. And part of, the, part of the reason is that they are working closely with Turkey. But another part of the reason is this uh, instrumentalization of Rojava's lack of recognition in the international arena. However, close to two-thirds of the ISIS prisoners and their family members are either Syrian or Iraqi. A majority of the people held by Roja in Rojava uh, ISIS camps are either Syrian and Iraqi. And the autonomous administration has different policies when it comes to the nationalities. If, it, if the former ISIS member is from a country anything other than Syria and Iraq, they are able to repatriate only if the country is willing to do so, and very few Western countries do this. And if the person, former ISIS member, is Iraqi, the Iraqi government has direct, you know, direct communication channels with the autonomous administration of Rojava and takes back, you know, uh, takes back the Iraqi citizens and places them in the camps that they have inside Iraq for former ISIS members. Uh, For the Syrians, the situation is complicated. The majority of the former ISIS people held in Rojava camps are of Syrian nationality. And on the one hand, ISIS prisoners are treated differently in the semi-carceral system that they have there. You know, all other prisoners are held in general prisons, where if you're tried related to something that's tied to ISIS, you go to ISIS-related courts and prisons that are reserved for ISIS members only. And former ISIS prisoners lose their properties. You know, the only type of people that get their stuff confiscated by the autonomous administration are former ISIS members. So there is this sort of harsh approach towards former ISIS members that are from the parts of Syria that are controlled under Rojava administration. However, 
There's also this attempt to not have this solely carceral approach to, you know, crime and punishment. And there is some sort of community arrangement. Uh, over the past 10 years, uh, a few hundred former ISIS-linked people have actually been set free, but uh, through these processes of alternative justice model uh, that I, I know uh, my comrade uh, will go into more detail in a minute. If, let's say, you're from Raqqa and you were involved with ISIS somehow, if you and your community can prove that you weren't a gun-wielding member that participated in the killing, you know, many people, when ISIS took over and ruled over a large spot of land for, you know, a few years, many people worked with ISIS, but not uh, zealously, you know, like driving stuff because they're told to or, you know, uh, doing nonviolent acts. So if you can prove that you weren't violent in ISIS, and if your community, your neighborhood from Raqqa, your relatives and uh, community vouch for you, and, you know, you go through this alternative justice process, then there is, then you, you would get released. However, like I said, uh, this depends on, this is a complex matter where this depends on sort of like the communal vouching and commun like the ability for the administration to arrange with the community so that this person's release won't risk life in the region. Uh, but, you know, is the burden on the camps and the maintenance of these camps because that has been a difficult uh, issue. ISIS, former ISIS members and their relatives still are trying to resurrect the caliphate inside these camps. One of the main reasons for these breakouts that ho happen periodically and they ca kill one another when if someone held in these camps is willing to talk to, you know, administrative officials or is willing to somewhat cooperate or show re re regret, you know, these imprisoned other ISIS people come and kill them. So uh, it's uh, very complicated and I'm sure my comrades will go into more detail. Yeah, thank you, Emery. Like that was a really good answer. That was a pretty comprehensive answer. And I think the only thing that I can add to it is to kind of reframe it a little bit for like a US audience who might be used to the way that prisons and like the carceral state work here. Um, and just kind of compare and contrast a little bit in order to make it a little bit easier to understand. Um, because that's that's generally the way I think of it. And so, like, I I don't know, I, I think that, that that might be, like, a good, uh, good communication strategy. And so, like, the thing I think that is the first thing to say about that is that the, the, auto the autonomous administration isn't really a state in the conventional sense. And I think that fact alone is like low key one of the biggest barriers in in terms of like getting international recognition because obviously you know <laughs> we, we we have like you know nato countries and stuff th these are all nation states and so it's like you know if you admit somebody who's like not a nation state it's kind of a threat to your control over the worldview of of like the planet and so you know this 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 i think is like one thing that people perhaps rightfully see as kind of threatening and so like the, the but that's that's the first thing is that is that the autonomous administration isn't really run like a state and so the way that things are enshrined here um where there's like endless bureaucracy and there's kind of like this cultural attitude that we have laws and you have to do exactly what it says by the letter of the law and like you can't stray a single like millimeter outside of that or else you'll 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 be put in jail and that's like the right thing to do the the kind of like cultural attitudes that you would find in Kurdistan are very different from that and this isn't just kurdish culture but kurdish culture is what i know the most about so that's what i'm going to go into i know that like so so there's there's kind of like a, a different attitude that comes out of like centuries of kurdish tradition and kurdish kind of like you know attitudes about law which is that if you if you're resorting to a law you're kind of already lost <laughs> you, you it's kind of already too late and so before they do that what they what they prefer to do instead kind of as a culture is is to look around and just kind of see what are the problems that we're facing and what can we do about those problems and so it's kind of it's 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 not prescriptive in that way it's much more of like for example in rojava there's a lot of issues with 
retribution killings. It's it's like similar to the mafia, the way that the mafia works, but it's it's definitely not the same. Where it's like my family, someone from my family killed your family, and so someone from your family has to do a retribution and kill someone from my family. And the cycle of violence just will continue. And so the way that they would approach that is to say, okay, well, instead of that, how about we just have like this neighborhood council of like people who live on the same street or people who live in the same area. And often it's the it's the grandmas, it's like the neighborhood grandmothers who would be the first responders to some kind of event, to, to some kind of like what we would think of as a crime. So like if there's one of these revenge killings, the first person who comes in response to that is is an, is a is a grandma from the neighborhood. And then what happens after that is like they don't they wouldn't consider the crime to be solved when like the perpetrator is found and then tried and you know, execute it or whatever. They consider the crime to be solved when there's like a, a truth and reconciliation consensus. Like, like there's a truth and reconciliation process and then that process will reach some kind of conclusion. And like the surviving parties uh, will usually agree to some kind of public show of okayness with this. Like there'll be some kind of like neighborhood feast or there'll be something. And it doesn't necessarily make things okay between those families, but it does make it so that the people who you live around, you know, you're held accountable to them. If somebody breaks the the kind of conditions of this truce, everyone in the neighborhood is going to know who did it and how. And so there will be consequences in that way. So it's like much more about social reinforcement than it is about any kind of rigid agent of the state coming after you, like the hand of God or whatever. That being said, there are definitely prisons in Rojava. And so like, like Emery was talking about, those prisons are usually reserved for people who are a real like direct safety threat to like the people who live in a community. And the name of the game is not really to punish those people it's to remove them as a safety threat so it's like you 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 take them to prison not to punish them but because they're like their presence is creates some kind of like unsafe condition and so you know the the kind of like the goal of of taking somebody to prison is much more focused on rehabilitation than it is retribution i think there's like a there's like a global cap of like 10 years that somebody can be in one of these prisons and often it's like much less than that and so the the incarceration rate among the general population is much lower. And in fact, like during, during the, like, I think it was early on in the pandemic, this might've been like at the end of 2020, I might need to fact check this, but there was definitely, you know, there the, I've, I'm blanking on the word that, I'm, but, but there were, there were people who were released from prison and they were just like forgiven and said, okay, you can go home because we can't keep you here because like there's an active f***ing plague <laughs> and that, that creates an unsafe condition for you. And amnesty is the word that I was looking for. Carceration is not the only piece of this. There's also like, for example, you know, there's the whole women, women's revolution. And one of the aspects of the women's revolution in Rojava is that there are women's communities where anyone, any any woman can like come with her children or with like her immediate relatives or whatever, her friends, what what have you. And they can, they can come and they can like escape from like a battered household situation and just come and stay and live for however long they need to live there and like learn a skill, learn something that, that can then be used to like economically sustain yourself. And you know, that's, that's also a really important piece of this. And so that's, that's like, that's like civil society. That's kind of how things work in normal circumstances where you just have like a neighborhood and there's like a, for lack of a better word, a crime rate in that neighborhood. That is very different from the ISIS problem. And so like the reason that that's very different and the reason that they don't resort to like laws in order to solve this problem is because it's a systemic problem. And like, it's the Syrian civil war. And so there's like all, everything is really complicated and everything is really dark and bleak and depressing. But one of the things that made ISIS possible is that civil wars create these really unstable conditions where you're not really sure where your security is going to come from. And so if this armed group shows up and they say, you have to, you have to like abide by whatever we're doing or else that doesn't excuse what you then do as a result of that, but it does change the way that you treat the problem because many of the people who were like what you might call Syrian civilians who, who came under the control of ISIS or who, or who, you know, was part of ISIS or whatever. A lot of those people didn't really, they weren't really true believers. Like they didn't join ISIS because they wanted to. They joined ISIS because they were forced to under like nightmarish circumstances. And again, that doesn't make it okay, but it does change the way that you treat the problem. And so there's a population of people who do stuff like that. And then there's a separate population of people who are generally true believers who come, you know, by choice from abroad. And like, like Emery was saying, that accounts for about a third of the of the population in these in these uh, ISIS prison camps um, in Al Hol particularly. And so, what you do with these people, the the third of the people who are like who are coming from abroad, that's a really thorny problem because the 
the autonomous administration isn't recognized and nobody wants to take these people back. And so again, I'm not like, I'm not making excuses for the conditions or, or anything like that. I'm just saying that like there's, there's a context here and that context is really important. Cool. I found that very helpful um, between the two of you. That was a very, as was mentioned earlier, the Basani um, governing Kurdish Democratic Party in Iraq has a contentious relationship with the autonomous administration and the democratic movement. Turkey has also been leading attacks into Iraq since last year, at least, uh, including allegedly using chemical weapons in the northern regions against what they are calling PKK militants. But that hasn't really been making the news from within the U.S. Um, does anyone want to uh, address these activities? I want to share a little bit about my uh, own experience. Um, I don't know the details about the allegations of the chemical weapons, but uh, I was at a demonstration in The Hague, half of May, where a British delegation, and among them Steve Sweeney, a journalist who has been in... Um, in the region himself for one year to investigate. He has collected samples of soil, hair and clothes that contain evidence that uh, banned chemical weapons have been used by Turkey. And on 17th of May, he and others would join the local Kurdish movement to go to the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, to hand over these uh, samples and to urge for a fact-finding team to go to the region to start their own investigations. But very unfortunately, the flight got cancelled, so they could not make it uh, to the Netherlands in time, which was very disappointing and frustrating. And then some other people from the, the demonstration, they took their place. Of course, they didn't have the samples, but they did have the letters and the files, so they went to the, the building the police was escorting them and it was so painful to see that they weren't even let inside the gates. They could not even enter the building into the reception to hand over these documents, but they were just left outside the gate. And I think they handed it over to somebody uh, who would take it inside. And that was so painful to see that it's not taken seriously, that uh, even with such a big demonstration and action and a, and a call out for support, that they are just not responding at all. To add on to Remark's point, Turkey has been using chemical weapons such as phosphorus bombs and cluster bombs, not only in northern Iraq, not only in Bashur, southern Kurdistan, against PKK militants in the Kandil Mountains area, but also in Rojava during its invasion of Serekania. Many families were affected by phosphorus bombs that were used by Turkish warplanes. And uh, there was this iconic image of a six, seven-year-old boy with all sorts of chemical burns on his body and samples collected in Rojava too. And the so-called international community, the globe has been deaf in the face of these attacks. And I think this is primarily due to the hostile approach that many countries have towards the Kurdish movement, you know, both in Rojava and in other parts of Kurdistan. Like we said several times uh, today, the recognition of PKK as a terrorist organization and the criminalization of <laughs> Kurd all Kurdish people, basically, not just the PKK through this logic. I mean, the PKK is the biggest, is the strongest Kurdish party with the biggest base in Kurdish society. We're talking about 30, 35 million Kurds in Kurdistan, and more than half of Kurds in Kurdistan f make up the base uh, of the PKK. So the West's contradictory, hypocritical approach towards the PKK and the Kurdish movement, I believe, is one of the main reasons for this turning a blind eye towards the use of active use of chemical weapons by a NATO member country. And this only serves to illustrate the hypocrisies about all the, you know, Western officials preaching about human rights and sort of democratic measures to be employed in warfare, including the banning of chemical weapons. I guess as long as you're a, you know, NATO member or a NATO ally and you're dropping chemical bombs on marginalized, criminalized communities such as the Kurdish movement and Kurdish people, you get a free pass at chemical warfare. 
Over the last 10 years of the Rojava revolution, radicals, anarchists, and feminists in the U.S. and abroad have attempted to raise awareness about the project in order to grow solidarity. But the only times, at least in the U.S., that I'm aware of, that the topic seems to come up are in the context of emergencies, invasions, and war. How have we in the U.S. in particular failed at engaging lessons, taking inspiration from, and building solidarity with the revolution in Rojava? And what has that lost us and our comrades over there and abroad? I would like to answer this question by really zooming in on my own journey, how I became involved. Not because my journey is special, but I think that uh, it explains a lot about how difficult it can be to navigate. As I said in my introduction, that I experienced sexual violence as a child uh, from a family member. And I was actually invited by another family member to join them for a vacation in Turkey in 2015. Um, and I wasn't aware of the struggle, of the Kurdish struggle yet then. And I remember that at the time there were some alerts about Turkey that you should not travel too close to the border uh, with Syria because there was unrest. And in that time, I only read about uh, Syria uh, in the headlines. I only saw headlines and I didn't know personally what exactly was going on. But because I was traveling there, uh, I wanted to read up and uh, research what what's going on, what's happening in this part of the world that I'm very ignorant about. So, of course, one of the first things I learned uh, was about the civil war. And then I learned about the PKK and about the women's revolution about the SDF and the YPG uh, fighting against ISIS and also being successful in pushing back against them. But uh, I was I was researching this alone. I was not connected with, uh, with organizers or anarchists uh, at that moment yet. So it was very confusing for me to find out who is who and who is fighting for what. In the beginning, I could not even distinguish between like the PKK and the YPG and the Free Syrian Army. I was not aware of it. So I had to research that even further. And then I was also, as soon as I started leaning more towards understanding that the PKK and the, the SDF and the YPG, uh, that they were struggling for values that I hold there as well. Uh, I started wondering, but if they are fighting this good fight for human rights and for liberation and against oppression, and if they are actually like the heroes of this moment in the sense that there are so many parts of the world where the governments and the people are so terrified of ISIS that they are paralyzed by fear and not doing anything and people on the streets being afraid of each other. And then I thought if, if they are so successful in fighting against ISIS, then why are they not celebrated? Why is this not... Uh, shared, especially like in the country where I'm from, in the Netherlands, there there's a really big ISIS scare. And I didn't understand why there, there wouldn't be more attention to this. Uh, so I became, I came in this struggle of like, it's it's everybody's word against everybody's word. And I, I stuck with it because I really wanted to find out what was going on. And then I also went at some point to a Kurdish culture event in uh, my area. Uh, and that's when I really started to embrace the Kurds and the revolution in Rojava. So by that time, it was more clear to me that uh, who is playing what role. And also that Turkey, Turkey's role was not dubious, but just evil. That Turkey is really uh, betraying all the values uh, and not, not out to commit genocide. That they have no excuse for their attacks. But then when I started joining the, the Kurdish community here in the Netherlands, that was also a bit of a culture shock. Because even though I was aware that we were living in a capitalist society and a patriarchal society, and that um, this was causing a lot of injustice and unheard voices, even though I was aware of it and already like finding the status quo as much as I could in my way, it was a culture shock to become accepted by the Kurdish community because then I felt that I became a part of the struggle and of the revolution. And it's also because the message of the revolution is uh, what, what I hold really dear. I think that's just a really important message. And that's why I am also really glad to participate today in the podcast, because the message is that it's not only 
a revolution in Rojava and in the Kurdistan region. It's not their revolution. It's from all of us. Because the way how the PKK decided at some point that they are not after their own state anymore, but they are instead going after a stateless world. When I really found out about it and I started sitting with this, uh, that's when I felt that this is really also my revolution and that I have a job to play here in the Netherlands. But it's it, it was a big step to start getting to know the Kurdish movement here and understanding what role I can play here. Because I, even though I fight against it, I do have a, a European and a Dutch uh, background. Uh, I'm not a Kurdish person. So I have a lot of work to do to change my mindset. And that is also where, because of the pandemic, uh, we could not organize anymore. Uh, and I lost contact with my uh, with my Kurdish friends. So that's where I started looking on the internet um, to find a community um, and to find resources and to, to keep on developing myself and to really become a student of the revolution, to understand what can I do here in the Netherlands. And that is how I found out about ECR. I joined the reading session of them. Um, and this is also my message to listeners who feel like they want to do something, but they are looking for ways to get involved and to make an impact. At ECR, um, we have reading sessions. One of the topics we uh, discussed was, and that was over like five or six sessions, we discussed similarities and differences between the Zapatista revolution and the Rojava revolution. And for the 8th of March, the International Women's Day, we had a, a session, of course, about women's struggle and achievement. And um, before that, we had really interesting sessions about the um, political economy and the cooperative economy in Rojava. And these are sessions where we uh, exchange equally, where we get to know each other. And then we also have once a month the organizing meetings where we try to practice what we are learning, try to inspire each other. Uh, we have updates from the region. And for me, it helped a lot to be connected with people who are very aware of what's going on because that helped um, seeing the roots uh, through the trees or seeing the forest through the trees again. Um, because if you're insecure about what is going on, that also makes you insecure to act and to speak out and to, to take action. So ECR has really helped me to stand stronger and form my own opinion and choose a strategy for myself to be a part of the revolution. Um, and I, so I would like to invite uh, listeners to join us for organizing meetings. Uh, you're welcome to join, however, like uh, whatever your background is or how much you know or don't know about it. You're always welcome to join us. Uh, you can get an update from the region. We also share news about what's going on in the United States revolving Rojava and Kurdistan. We share actions uh, that we are taking um, to build uh, a broader solidarity. Because this is, as I said, it's not uh, only a Kurdish revolution. It's not only Rojava. It is um, a struggle and a resistance that is worldwide. That we are connected in our struggle against capitalism and patriarchy. And then at the end of the meetings, we also have the phone banking. Where um, friends of us from ECR, they always do a really great job of putting together a message of concern. Um, and they have um, other phone numbers from relevant uh, people of the government in the United States, and we make the calls. And as uh, Xero said, that might be a bit boring or even like doesn't feel good for people, but it is a really important part, especially as European or uh, American people, to really uh, raise the noise in our own countries and to bring our message because they need to hear our story. And you can find us at uh, defendrojava.org. There you can also sign up to get notifications about events and news. I'll follow Rimak's example and begin with explaining how I became started to become involved with ECR. Soon after its establishment in 2019, well, I, I was already in touch with one, of, you know, with co-founders such as Anya and a couple other comrades. And I'm working on women's autonomous organizing in Rojava in my dissertation 
particularly in the economic arena, you know, cooperatives, collectives, communes. And, you know, in addition to all the wonderful things we do at ECR, uh, we've been doing over the past three years that Primark outlined just now, I've been involved with Anya and a couple of comrades with trying to establish connections and increase solidarity with different cooperatives across the U.S. We've been meeting with uh, representatives from cooperatives in and around New York City, but also, you know, from different parts of the cooperatives from different parts of the U.S. We've been in communication with Equal Exchange, Fair World Project, Collab Cooperative, and USF WC Peer Tech Network, among other cooperatives. We've been trying to build connections with cooperatives and collectives in Rojava. Um, as an anarchist myself, I value this growth of you know international uh, solidarity among different cooperatives in different parts of the world. However, you don't have to be an anarchist. You know, whatever excites you in life, whatever you've been working on more, there are options to build solidarity with your comrades in Rojava. I know, for example, if you're an active feminist in the US or in Europe, unorganized active feminist, and you want to build solidarity, that's also much valued and possible, both through the ECR, which, you know, tries to contribute to this growth of solidarity, but also Kurdish women's movement, which is very well established inter internationally, particularly in Europe. And I know there have been meetings with, you know, different women's organizings from North and Latin and South America. So whatever you're working on, whatever uh, moves you in life, there is possibility of growing solidarity and uh, connections with corresponding similar organizations and people in Rojava. And the Rojava uh, Revolution, Democratic Confederalism is an anti-nation state, internationalist vision that does not only limit itself to the uh, to, Mid to, Mid to Kurdistan or the Middle East, but for the entire world. So any collaboration uh, in that sense would be much valued and appreciated. Yeah, I, I I would echo what I heard both of Nikki and and um, Emery say, which I thought was they were really beautiful responses. And I think that like, you know, here, so like one of the things that I personally have learned, <laughs> this is going to sound really contradictory. One of the things that I personally have learned over the course of my organizing as I get closer and closer to indigenous movements here on Turtle Island is the importance of not centering yourself, but also like the utility of, of centering yourself and when it's appropriate to and when it's not appropriate to and like the way that things are things have to be balanced and you know I think that that's that's something that's really important that I take away from all of this so I, I had the good fortune to sit down with a Kurdish journalist Chabat Abbas uh, who you know you'll you'll hear the interview that I did with her we'll be dropping an episode uh, you know, after we start dropping episodes. But that was a really wide ranging conversation. And one of the things that I really took away from that was this notion of trying to sit with all of the many, many contradictions in life. And like, not just contradictions of like ideas or whatever, but contradictions of feeling and thought, you know, the way that like really intense genocides tend to also happen at the same time as incredible social movements towards, you know, progressive ideas of like feminism and liberation and stuff. And the way that like you can't you you can't really separate the two. That was a really powerful idea. I think that like some cultures might call that I I'm again forgetting the name. Like non-dualism. I think that like Buddhists would have like a lot of a lot to say about this idea of like you know the yin and the yang and how like good and evil aren't really opposites they're they're two sides of the same coin and, and and stuff like that i think it's like i've come around to the idea that these are all things that are too important to carry just one name and we have versions of them in our own culture and so trying to trying to see these things as like a gift and the gift comes in the form of a seed and you can choose to plant that seed and you can like even tend it like a garden because like the way that the way that culture works a lot of the time is a lot like soil. Like you have to look at the nutrients that are in the soil and you can you can maintain the soil and you can change what the nutrients are over time, but it's not going to happen overnight. <laughs> it's going to happen with a lot of work and a lot of like really hard, dedicated effort. 
over the course of generations even. And that's like what that's what the Kurds and other people who live in the region have achieved because Rojava didn't like the, the Rojava project as a polity didn't come about because somebody woke up one day and said, hey, let's let's, you know, fundamentally revolutionize everything that we're doing in civil society. It came about because like these cultures or like these these traditions have been practiced for centuries. <laughs> and there was a lot of dedicated organizing that happened in the years before the Syrian civil war. The, like like the PKK is definitely a factor. The early stage of the YPG and the YPJ, which are the people's defense units and the women's defense units, these like self-defense militias in the region, those also didn't come out of nowhere. They they were they were trained with like the help of the PKK and in many instances they have, you know, overlapping membership, but it like these these things don't just happen in a vacuum. They come about because there's a need for them, even when there's not a civil war going on. And so I look around at like the situation in the context where I live, and I see that like there's there's a dire need for that. And I know I'm not the first person to notice that. This is not an original observation in any way. But like things in the U.S. right now are getting to a dire point where I re I really worry a lot about you know the possibility of genocidal violence in the near future and like the violence that it, that's going to be perpetrated against queer people and trans people over the summer and how that's actually about racism when you boil it down and how like nothing is new under the sun <laughs> and all everything that happened before will happen again like what you know whatever whatever you want to like bring out to to say that but like it's it, all of that is to say that you have these dark things that are happening at the same time as you have incredibly positive things. And the incredibly positive things that I take from Rojava, um, the things that really stood out to me and the things that I really connected with immediately were the women's revolution and the structure of civil society. Like, those are the things that made me realize that I'm an anarchist. I just didn't put the word to it um, for, for, like, a long time. And realizing those things, it was like a very nonlinear process where I just kind of made all these realizations in my own life and started realizing that like, I, I, I fit into that context too. And like, I can be part of those organizing efforts. And like, that's, that's a new commitment that I have in my life that I feel more like myself than I have in a very long time because I've was introduced to these ideas. And so I think that like, you know, there's a lot there that's on the personal level, on the societal level, the structural level. And a, a, a lot of it goes off in very different directions, but like that's kind of the beauty of it is that all of that is part of it. All of that has to be part of the whole. That like the the opposition has to be part of the system. <laughs> yeah, and so like when I think about what can be done and like how the U.S. has failed, I think those are important questions to grapple with. And there's a lot of like very serious critiques to be made. I think that what it distills down to for me is like a reaction, like an interaction that I had with somebody on Twitter recently, somebody that's based in the UK, but that, that like does a lot of this kind of like anarchist organizing and stuff. And they kept complaining about what the f is in the water over there in the US. Like what the f are you people talking about like all the time? And that got me to thinking very seriously about, you know, the context that I grew up in, which was like this, like small towns in the Rust Belt and just kind of like what, what it is like emotionally to grow up that way in that area, in that context and how that plays differently from like people who grew up in different contexts, in different geographies and stuff. But yeah, I, I'm rambling now, but I, I just, it's all of this. Like, it, like it's, it's, it's really complex and it's really nuanced and I just love every minute of it. That's basically my answer. That's awesome. All of those answers were really really enlightening and I really appreciate them. And so Rimak already mentioned the website and how to get in touch and invited listeners into the project. I wonder if any of you individually have projects. I mean, Zero mentioned the podcast, but if any of you have places where listeners can reach out to you personally over social media, or if you have collections of writings that you've done, anything like that you want to share, it's okay if you don't. Um, I, I guess I can start. So like the podcast that I mentioned is called Where Many Worlds Fit. You can find, I guess, me on Twitter and on Instagram. The handle is many underscore worlds underscore pod, spelled just like it sounds. I think that there's also an email, which is many.worlds.pod at protonmail.com. And so if anybody wants to get in touch or if you want to, you know, follow along there, there's like a couple of articles that have been posted on the website, which is manyworldspod.github.io. It's hosted on GitHub because I don't I don't I don't like paying for software and I'm a software developer by trade and so I just like do, did all of that myself. <laughs> um yeah, and so like I I, I that's 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 like where to find me. 
Well, thank you. Thank you all for having this conversation and for taking all this time out of out of your busy lives to not only do this work, but to share it with the audience and with myself. Yeah. And uh, thanks again. <laughs> Can I uh, share one thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the examples I gave earlier that people can do on an individual level and get involved, uh, speak for themselves. But um, what I also love about being uh, involved with ECR is that they are really taking the steps necessary and really big steps in the United States to bring the message of the Rojava Revolution forward um, and to also approach Congress um, because they've drafted now a resolution with... Um, legislation that they want to see changed so the people in the area can be protected because they would they have to have political ref- recognition uh, but also because Turkey has uh, built dams uh, causing uh, whole areas to be without water so daily life is obstructed in the ep- epidemic that was really um, catastrophe on catastrophe not to mention uh, the effects on uh, food supplies So even though EZR is um, like a relative small organization, uh, they are really owing up to the revolution and to making the change and impact they can do. So that's why I also love to organize with them because I can learn so much from them. And I want to thank you for taking the time because we've we've spoken over two hours. I don't know how long your (laughs) podcast usually is, but um, thanks for taking the time and listen to us uh, and not feeling any rush. Yeah, thanks a lot for having us, Bruce. This has been a great conversation. Yeah, I've appreciated getting to chat with um, all of y'all. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to... There's some promotion here for um, for your podcast, which I'm pretty excited about. <laughs> yeah, me too. I think we just need to, like, knuckle down and do it. <laughs> Take care, Hibals. You too. Take care, team. This is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop. <laughs>